So I'm going to call the Town Finance Committee meeting of Tuesday, November 19, 2019, to order at 2.35 p.m. And uh, to note for the record that two, um, two members of the committee are unable to be with us today, uh, Shalini Ball Milne, who's a council member and one of the resident members, non-voting members, Mary Lou Tomlin, is not going to be able to um, be here either. Uh, we have a fairly lengthy and complex agenda, and um, I'm going to take things not in order of the agenda um, because I want to uh, conserve the um, very valuable time of um, some of our people um, who've come to help explain one of the issues, and that's um, agenda item three which is a recommendation from the Community Preservation Act Committee to make an allocation for Community Preservation Act funds out of the usual sequence of um, the CPA, which um, has traditionally come to um, town meetings in the council in the summer after um, a process um, that goes through the spring. So I want to um, introduce uh, Nate Buddington, who is the chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee, who can um, uh, just briefly um, state the explanation. There also is a memo in our packet on the subject, and then um, share with uh, our uh, assistant town manager, David Zomack, an explanation of the project itself, um, and uh, we, um, and I think that one of the two of you, if you could, explain the um, time um, urgency of um, action because we do need to make a recommendation to the council. Uh, we cannot delay this um, for another meeting if we're going to. Uh, meet grant requirements, but you can explain that. So, uh, Nate. Thank you. Uh, in early 2020, we'll be presenting to you a whole host of proposals uh, for approval, as we normally do. But we're asking for um, an expedited approval of this one particular project, which is to construct a playground in Kendrick Park. Um, Here's the reason why we are here today. Uh, the town has secured a $400,000 park grant for this project, which has a total cost of $659,000. So they have come to CPA, and we have enthusiastically and unanimously endorsed their request for $259,000, which is the remaining balance of the cost of the park after the grant. Uh, I think somewhat late in the game, the town um, was informed that in order to receive the park grant, the entire cost of the project needs to be approved and budgeted by the town by December 31. So uh, what we're requesting is that we, because we have no <coughs> money right now in the CPA kitty, that you approve a, a borrow for the full cost of the park, uh, which or the playground, which will be 659,000. We will only need to, at the end of the day, borrow the CPA part of that because the park rent will, will cover that cost. It's not really being reimbursed. As, just, as it turns out, we just won't need to borrow that much once um, the park rent is formally in hand. Um, so this is a, a and, and Mr. Zomak will describe the particulars of the park, but this is a, a really exciting project that we've talked about sort of informally. When I was on the LSSE commission, we talked about this informally and in CPA as well as a, as a way to really add to our efforts to really bring families into the center of town. Um, Is that, is that describe Thank the timing to everyone's satisfaction? Okay. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to uh, 
Mr. Zomek. Great, okay. thank you very much. And I'll try to be brief. We do have a couple of slides and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here with, with both Nates uh, today. And I wanna call uh, Nate Malloy, our senior planner up in just a minute, um, because he was the one that successfully wrote the grant with support and collaboration uh, with the LSA, from the LSSE uh, department as well as the planning department. So I started my presentation the other night to the CPAC with an apology, and the apology, it's, it's kind of hard to apologize for a $400,000 grant from the state, but the apology really stems from, as Nate described, the process. And so um, we need to go back just very briefly. I'll take you back to 2011. So back in 2011, we had a very robust process to design a wonderful park uh, uh, use of uh, and design for Kendrick Park. Uh, this was a committee that the town manager and select board worked with very closely. It was, um, uh, the staff liaison was Christine Brestrup and dozens and dozens of people participated in that process. Unfortunately, budgetary constraints and the economy and other factors at that time basically caused us to kind of put that wonderful design which is here on this board uh, to my left and then on the screen above you really on hold. But one of the themes that kept coming through as, as in my in my uh, uh, my day to day, week to week, month to month work with our economic development director, with the bid, with the chamber, with the LSSE commission, with the planning department, this theme kept coming through time and time again. Parents with young children want more to do downtown. When they come to the Jones Library, they want something outdoor, outdoors, athletic, active to do. Uh, when they come down to the farmer's market on Saturday, during the active time of the farmer's market, they want something to do. And so we began to look around. We looked at Sweetser Park, we looked at the North Common through that process, the main part of the common, and given all of these factors, we really determined that Kendrick Park was the right location. And we look back to the 2011 plan and lo and behold, um, we hadn't forgotten about this, but we wanted to, to, to bring this out in kind of a, a, an exclamation point. We had designed the group, a large group of, of uh, residents and volunteers had, had included a play area mid, mid park here in Kendrick Park. And so we pulled this plan uh, off the shelf and, and out digitally and we began to talk to LSSC and we began to talk to folks in the community and we were encouraged to apply for the park grant. Uh, we applied for that back in July of 2019. And as Nate said, it takes the state a long time to respond. And so lo and behold, um, about three, four weeks ago, we found out and we were very excited that we got the maximum award. $400,000 is the maximum award. This is a 70-30 grant. So the state will pay 70% of the grant. The town municipality needs to match it with 30%. So we had this great news and we wanted to bring it to CPAC. Nate Malloy, who is our, our lead contact with the park, pro park program, very quickly found out through an information session with them that we needed to do this very quick turnaround. We needed to have a municipal vote by 1231-19 and we need to move very quickly on the grant. We need to have a design by June of 2020. And then we have a little breathing room, not a lot, but we have about a year, if I'm not mistaken, and Nate can come up here in a minute, to construct the playground. So it's an exciting opportunity to enhance our downtown. The state is willing to pay 70% of the cost of this playground. We've done uh, a couple of public um, information sessions that were well attended, the LSSE Commission, the LSSE um, uh, and planning departments um, worked together to uh, sponsor those. And we have not designed the, the elements of the playground, but we needed to come up with a, a rough design to come up with a cost estimate. So we would look if the council uh, is supportive of us moving forward uh, with this approach, then we would hold a number of um, small information sessions and, and uh, design workshops, if you will, in December and January and quickly come up with a design. So the location is, as I said, let me just scroll down a little bit here. Um, 
In order to submit the grant, we needed to come up with a preliminary design. We worked with Berkshire Design Group out of Northampton to come up with a preliminary design. Um, it would include walkways, some active play areas, as I said, uh, sh either shade structures or newly planted trees, and it would be mid-park, again, in the midpoint of Kendrick Park. It would also make part of the park accessible to, universally accessible. And this is really critical because right now we only have a, a sidewalk on the east side of Kenrick Park. The rest of the park is nice, it's green. There's quite a bit of topographic relief. There's some hilly portions, but none of it um, is ADA. Um, so let me stop there. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Nate and he can explain, uh, Nate Malloy can explain the budget and the process a little bit. And again, we're excited by the grant. We received the maximum award, but unfortunately the state does put us on a very tight timeline to try to make this happen. So Nate, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the budget. Sure, thanks. The, um, yeah, so that's a, it's a two-year grant. You know, it starts, um, you know, it's for this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Uh, the program requires a full project allocation up front before they enter into a contract with the municipality. So that's why we need to, you know, we're required to have a vote for the full project cost, even though, you know, as we're showing here, the first uh, year is for a design. So, you know, there's a 50,000 allocation for this fiscal year, and then the remainder is the following fiscal year for construction, but the state won't allow a staggered vote or allocation, so it really has to come, you know, up front. The, um, you know, 400,000 is the maximum, and, uh, you know, we have the full project cost. So I think the, the concept design, although Dave said it's not complete, you know, we were pretty thorough in what we, what we determined the cost to be. So I don't wanna say it was conservative, but you know, that's, that's the ceiling. You know, there's not any moving elements in terms of, you know, it's not a spray park. There's not a lot of, I wanna say there's too much equipment. So we can, you know, when, with Groff Park, there was, it was a very big expansion. Well, you know, it's happening now. This is a much smaller scale, so, um, you know, that is the, the limit, the ceiling of the, of the project for this, you know, for, for the playground, so we can work backwards from that. Um, you know, I will say that the state has a pretty rigorous schedule, so even if the vote occurs now, they do expect a design process to be done by really about May, mid-May. They want a reimbursement to be submitted by June 1st, and they'd like to see construction start next summer, so late July or August and it has to be done by June 1st of 2021. The park grant has said they do not allow extensions or modifications. They don't roll money over from fiscal year. So what's allocated this fiscal year is reimbursed this fiscal year. What's for next fiscal year is next fiscal year. And they don't, you know, that's kind of it. They don't, they don't make any exceptions or extensions or amendments. So we've asked, it'd be nice if they did. But. So in, in conclusion, we've worked and we really appreciate the uh, CPAC um, meeting twice in the last two weeks to fully consider this and recommend it to you. Um, we've worked very closely with, with Sonia and her team on, on the budget piece of it. Um, and I defer to Sonia if you have any questions about how this would work within, uh, within, within CPAC and with the borrowing but we're happy to take questions from the committee at this point. Okay, yeah. Um, as you know, I, I heard a presentation on this earlier, so I have more some specifics that hadn't occurred to me um, that are on the project. As I see the uh, timeline that Nate just talked about and then heard the other Nate <laughs> talk about when CPAC money can be spent, um, you know, you can start to vote it, but not till July. The design phase, that 50,000 has to be town dollars, or can, once you get the grant award, can you be reimbursing? So I'm, I'm seeing that right. it has to be happening in this fiscal year versus the next fiscal year. It's the two fiscal year questions um, on this project. Then I have another one that's not specific to this project, but that's my first question. Sure, the, the order, you know, the vote for council is for this fiscal year, so it's a borrowing in anticipation of grant reimbursement, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure Sonia can answer, but I think the idea is that, you know, in the end, the town would spend 15000 this fiscal year, you know, up to 15000 and that money would, 
um, I guess be C would be CPA money. Um, is that correct? Sonia? That, Sonia? that is my that's my question. Right. You've got the question, yeah. Well, um, because it's a borrowing authorization, what would happen is whatever is spent is it this year would be covered through borrowing through a temporary borrowing, even if it's fifteen or thirty-five. It'll be the fifty thousand dollars if it's spent in this fiscal year. We'll cover that. It'll roll right back over in the new fiscal year, it's just to prevent a deficit in year end so it doesn't hit our free cash, but it's all borrowing. It won't be any cash capital from any anything. Does that answer your question? Or? I, think, I think so, because I heard it, you know, the securing the grant requires what you're asking us to do now, and so that 400,000 is secured, but I was thinking if we can't tap into the CPA money till July, but I, th I think this has been answered on how that, that four month or eight month of this year gets covered. Did you, was there another? Oh, I Dorothy had a question. I Okay, so the map, I have it on my computer and I have it there. Could you put your finger, I think I know where it's supposed to be, could you put your finger on the paper map? Oh, sure. Okay, so that other larger space in back of it is still free. Right, so, it's envisioned as a green lawn or open Green lawn, okay. Yeah. So that's question one. And question two, I guess I thought state gives money, we give money, but you said reimbursement grant, so that means that we have to front all money and when we've finished it, then the state gives us the money. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So there, right. So just your first question, that on this design, here's the concept. That triangular path really mimics the 2011 plan. So it's really in almost the same location. So, you know, we envisioned it almost as phase one of the build out of Kendrick. So if we wanted to take the 2011 plan and implement more of it, we're, you know, we're following it pretty closely. So we're not, you know, um, we wouldn't have to come up with a new design for the park. Um, in terms of the fund, the funding, it is a reimbursement grant. So, you know, um, they used to call it a match, but then people assume that you know they would spend some and the state would spend some. Mm -hmm. But the way the state works, they you know they reimburse the, a community on the on what percentage. So, it really is a reimbursement. But you know that money, we have to do it within a fiscal year. So as Sonia said, it you know the the books balance at the end. So. Um, you know, we, that we have to allocate the full project cost, spend the money, and then get reimbursed. Okay, Could I? Dorothy had one more question. Okay. I'm trying to read the little picture of the design, the, the 2011 design. I see um, something about, it, it looks like maybe you're gonna be adding some parking on the side by having them park slantway so that there would be some, if people came to the park to play, they'd be able to park there. This is a great question. In, in the original 2011 plan, we had proposed to add parking on the east side of Kendrick, uh, west side of Kendrick Park. We are not proposing that in this plan, um, partly out of budgetary considerations, but partly because there's so much discussion right now of parking in downtown that we really didn't want to complicate that mix. And frankly, it would have made the budget go up considerably. So uh, we believe that um, there's, you know, this is within walking distance of lots of parking. Uh, there's parking uh, both on East Pleasant um, and North Pleasant and the surrounding streets. Uh, there's a municipal parking lot off of Prey Street. So we're at this point not proposing to pay for or add or change any parking. Uh, you know, uh, there is parallel parking on the street now. You know, we had, that design had nose in parking and kind of a reconfiguration of the roadway at that section of Kendrick Park, and we're not undertaking that right now. Yeah. Good, add, Dave. If I could add one thing just for context here, because um, from time to time in my travels at meetings and conversations I have with, with members of the council, with, with residents, with committee members, um, I want to give a sense that... Um, these things we do um, have, have threads that connect them. So somebody might say, well, you know, Dave, you, you know, the North Common is on hold right now. Why are you, why, why, is, why is the planning department working with LSSE through CPAC to go for Kendrick Park? Well, the answer to that is that we fully explored putting a playground on the North Common. For those of you who might have participated in that process, that was a reoccurring theme. 
However, when we put all the factors together, the size of the North Common, the topography of the North Common, the potential cost of adding a playground to the North Common, the historic nature of the North Common, all of those factors led us to believe that that was not the right location to put a playground. However, as planners, we carried the, 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 the desires and the requests, um, and in this case, very strong and very consistent requests of parents with young children. We carry those with us and we say, what's the next opportunity? So when the park grant came up, what my job is is to gather staff, to gather committee input from LSSC, from the planning board, from various committees and boards, and say, okay, what, was, what are the reoccurring themes? We have a park grant opportunity, what should we apply for? Recall that we applied twice for the North Common and we were turned down. So it was my decision to say, we're not gonna go for three strikes on the North Common, let's, let's call it quits at two. They, for some reason, didn't like uh, our, our proposals there. The common is different than a park. This is a park. So what we did was we carried that theme through and we said, where is the most logical place and where is the place with, frankly, the least resistance? I say that in, or the best place from a planning standpoint to put a, a playground and this was it. We looked at Sweetser, we looked at the North Common, we looked at the Main Common, we also looked over at Community Field. The feedback we got at Community Field was twofold. The playground there is very old and, and needs a lot of work, but it's too far from downtown. Parents with young children weren't willing to walk that far, even though it's, you know, what is it, six blocks? Um, this was the logical place. So that's our thinking, that's how we we try to plan and we try to look for opportunities. So we saw the park grant as an opportunity to get 70% of a downtown playground paid for by the state. And they rewarded us with this grant. Good, Bob? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a couple of questions about the grant itself. Mm -hmm. How prescriptive is it? In other words, um, if you complete a specific design, mm -hmm. do you need to then follow that design in order to be reimbursed from the, from the grant? Or can you, you know, change the design during construction because you find something that you have to do that, number one. Number two, um, if you only get 80% of the construction completed, will we receive the 80% the of the grant or do we lose the grant altogether? And then third is once we submit for the reimbursement, how long will it take for the state to actually reimburse us? Sure. So the um, you know we we applied with a concept here, which you know they said it needs to be detailed enough to get a cost estimate. So you know here's the concept in terms of you know when it's actually being constructed, we'll you know we'll work with a designer to come up with final plans and specifications. <laughs> so you know we have a few months, you know three four months to come up with a final plan. So once that plan is you know, the state reviews it, they like to review it when we, we go out to bid on it, that it really doesn't change. So, um, you know, we have, a, you know, we have a process to come up with that final plan, but once we actually, you know, try to hire a contractor and go through that, then there really isn't much changing. You know, there could be minor things on the ground, for instance, like a bench may move a little bit, but it's not like we're gonna say this walkway should go somewhere else. It, you know, little things can happen, but the, you know, overall plans stay the same. Um, you know, and as a reimbursement program, so, the state reimburses 70% of our cost up to $400,000. So if the project is um, cost less than we anticipate or you know, we don't spend it all, we only get reimbursed 70% of what we spend. So, you know, for instance, if, we, if you know, if miraculously it's much cheaper than we think and we save a little money, the state doesn't, you know, we won't get the full 400,000, we might get a little less. Uh, in terms of the reimbursement, I think they say they have 45 days to turn it around. So. You know, the latest we can submit is July, um, and they get it to us by September. So, yeah, if I could just follow up, uh, part of the question was, if we don't finish the design by the end of FY21, in other words, if we only finish the construction rather, we've only completed 80% of the construction, do we lose the entire grant, or do we get reimbursed up to that whatever we've spent? We get reimbursed to what we've spent. You know they'll, you know they'll 
they'll monitor the first year to make sure the design is getting coming along so that we can you know bid it for construction next fiscal year. So um, you know they're invested in it as much as we are. So you know the big push was to have the full project cost voted by this end of this calendar year because they need to know then that we can move. That's what they need to sign a contract with the town. So then they know we can move forward with the design. And so you know if it was much later, they might you know they could always say well. How late is it going to be? You know, does this you know does this really push your design back? So I think, you know, we're you know it is an expedited process, so we can meet their deadlines. Thank you. Um, two questions. Just my my sense is the state will do everything to work with you to make sure that you don't send money back. <laughs> they really don't want you to do that. They, right, they don't like right. that. Right. Um, the, but going back to your design been up on Kendrick Park recently, I had the impression this was in that lower circle area. Uh, so the, in right here? Yeah. So the, the, the you know, here's, here's the, um, you know, the former Bertucci building, and there's, you know, there's a, a driveway right now against the park, and so it really is the same location, so it is right here. This amphitheater, you can see on the plan, there's a, a, uh, maybe like a three foot grade change here. So there's topography here. So when we have, uh, we'll use this as the foundation of our plan and when we actually have the site visits to say, hey, what's a good place for a playground? And this really was a really nice location, both for topography because there's already a driveway curve here and cut here. So it's pretty flat and it works with this design. So it is, it's up a little further than the reason I'm asking this is because as we've had conversations with the bid mm -hmm. about their interest in helping the town have some kind of entertainment right. uh, shelter or a, you know band shell or what it performance shell mm -hmm. um, the two different options one is Kendrick Park and the other one is the town common and I just want to make sure that we're not precluding the use of Kendrick Park because we've kind of cut it in the middle with the playground. I don't think that's really the case. I mean, it's, this is not, may, maybe could give us an estimate of the dimensions of the actual port in place structure but this is not a really, in comparison to Groff Park, this is a fairly modest um, playground, and the area you see on the, the map to the north is really quite substantial. So if, for instance, there was a decision made to put a performance um, uh, venue of some sort up there, there's plenty of room both for that as well as seating, grass seating or otherwise. And as Nate said, the topography does change to the south of the proposed site, and we also have the Tan Brook going under that section of the park. So the, 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 the midsection is where the Tan Brook is culverted and goes right under the park. So we really don't want to touch the Tan Brook at this point. We want to let it do, do its thing, and it's been culverted there for a long, long time, and it seems to be functioning just well, just fine. But I think in the plan, the um, you know there's the amphitheater south of the mm -hmm. playground. So the amphitheater is here again, proposed. Yeah, we're not proposing to build any of this at this point. Oh, the so playground nice. here, and then this very large space for concerts, for throwing a frisbee, a ball, having a pickup game of sport, some sport, ultimate, whatever, right there. Yeah, I think, and you know that area where the playground is actually pretty heavily treed, so it's. It's a shady area, and the playground works pretty nicely with existing vegetation. So, you know, I think the two open lawns are were areas that had been planned for, you know, larger gatherings, whether it's you know festivals or music. Or um, th what looks like below the what's being now called performance areas, but towards the southern end, is that a walkway that was drawn into a, an early schematic, or this area here, Andy? Um, yeah. Right here? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so in the original Kendrick Park design, um, we really, the group, envisioned um, this area being very active. Actually, a good portion of this would be hardscaped. 
Um, again, not in, the, not in our vision right now, um, because we know there's lots of budget uh, uh, concerns and, and priorities. But this, this area was envisioned for um, maybe um, a farmer's market, art exhibits, um, um, other active um, um, efforts like that. And then there'd be a connecting walkway here, connecting any existing and new development to the east, and then um, you know some of the more historic uh, development over on the McClellan Street side. So that would connect there. Again, we do in the budget is this walkway and then this walkway. And of course, this was already built. It's not quite exactly as this plan indicated, but there's already an eastern uh, uh, sidewalk on the eastern side of Kendrick. Some of it. Yep. So second question is if the Boy Scouts were here today and asking the question as to whether the park would still um, allow for Christmas tree sales, is there still sufficient space? Absolutely, right here is where they sell Christmas trees now. Yeah, we wouldn't be in that location where they- We're not even close. And uh, it's my recollection, but I just, now that you have your mouse pointer again, I thought that the uh, Tan Brook ran under close to the Kendrick Place building, sort of between there and Bertucci's, is that, it's not that far north? Uh, it comes in, if this is the old Bertucci's here, Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it comes right in through here. Yeah, it comes right through, yeah. So cool. it's a little further And then south. it daylights over off of McClellan and then heads due north into the campus uh, where the visitor center is. It's undergrounded there. It daylights again at the campus pond. Um, a very large culvert here. Okay. Um, Kathy. A question that came up at CPA was about um, benches, picnic tables, places to sit, and the, this playground would include some additions to that. Is that correct? So I think, to me, that was your, it's a playground, but you're also opening up an area for people to congregate, mm -hmm. which is not, doesn't exist right now. We've got this big piece of land, but right. if you wanted to bring a picnic and sit down, there's, so you're in Right now you'd have to sit on the ground, which is fine. We're which is here. okay, but I mean, it also yeah. gives you a place to do this, yes? Absolutely, yeah. to come with a picnic, come with your family. Um, again, it would be ADA, both the, the there would be a poured in place, a rubberized structure under the, the entire playground, which is really required at this point for ADA purposes. Um, we would try to incorporate as many of the play structures uh, would be, uh, um, universally designed for those people with disabilities, children and, and families could enjoy um, as many of those um, uh, activities in the, in the playground as possible. And then really, very importantly, is the, is the walkways themselves would open up access to the park where we would have seating areas around the park. Again, this is just a conceptual design. Um, so we would design that with a group, including LSSC commission members, planning, Planning uh, department staff, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. There is a budget and, line for those amenities, so it was, you know, they were actually can be pretty expensive for benches. So we factored in. I, I think there was at least eight, maybe more, in tables. You know, a few tables and other things. So there was a, you know, a budget line for that. You know, in terms, I know you talked about there'll be a community input and design part of this, but one of the things I noticed that Amherst College has done, and I don't know whether it ends up being cheaper or not but behind this beautiful new science center that they have, their outdoor seating area are giant rocks <laughs> that the glaciers moved in. So I'm sure it was ex somewhat expense to move the rock there, but I think the maintenance of the rock will be fairly low. <laughs> but, but it's nice seating, it's re really, and it would be pretty cool for kids mm -hmm. because you could crawl yep. on the rocks, you know, I mean, they're not just a, tr so I'm just thinking creatively about what's the seating place and lower maintenance costs would be useful as you think about w what's possible within the grant funds. No, that's a great point. Um, and, and if I could, I'll just point out over here under features, we, we left the door wide open, natural and traditional playground elements. Many people think of you know, kind of something like this at a schoolyard or, you know, near an elementary school. 
but then you have less traditional, more kind of naturalistic features like this. Again, this would all come out in the design process. I know the director of the bid uh, is behind me and, and we've talked about it. I know the bid and the chamber would like to participate in the design process. Um, I'd be happy to give up my seat if, if Gabrielle wanted to make a comment with the chair's yeah. permission, but we very much would like to gather input from the community in the design, uh, element, uh, the design phase. Yeah, um, Gabrielle, when, um, I was gonna ask if you wanted to, to speak or comment at some point, but I, um, the other thing that we need to talk about very briefly and I didn't know if it made sense to go before uh, uh, which order to put it in, I don't care, but we do need to talk about the draft um, council order 2045, which is what the actual item is that we would be recommending as a finance committee to the council for adoption. And essentially there are three parts to it. Um, and Part one transfers care, custody, and control of the park to LSSC Commission, and I know you can talk about that, why that's necessary. And the second, the second part has to do with the appropriation itself, and the third is to authorize the um, grant application and acceptance of the grant um, so that um, it closes that out. Um, Regarding the first part, um, which is the care and custody of the LSSC Commission, um, aside from the um, you know brief explanation as to why that's required, the other th um, question that now comes to mind, because I know the LSSC is going through a planning process, if they reorganize the way that they um, are going to proceed as the provider of recreation in, in the town um, and the commission ends up being recommended to be replaced by some other body or some other mechanism or LSSC is transferred, becomes a department of the town. Where does all of that fit in with um, the change of care, custody and control of some uh, of, to the commission under these uncertain circumstances? Well, I'll take a quick stab at that and maybe Nate can add to it, but just so the, so you know, part A is required by the state. So the state is offering $400,000 grant to the town. Um, there's the carrot. There's a little bit of a, a stick, if you will, in that they wanna make sure that the town of Amherst a year from now or five years from now doesn't decide, well, thank you very much, State, for that grant. We're gonna pave over that park and tear it out in half a day and do something else with that park. So Part A is required by the State. We have done this uh, at a couple of other parks throughout town. It is very common practice. It's, it's required to accept the grant. Um, right now, Kendrick Park is under the, the uh, care, custody, and control of the town manager, so this would at least legally move that to the care, custody, and control um, of the LSSC Commission. My understanding is that virtually every town in Massachusetts has some form of either LSSC or a recreation commission or a recreation department. Um, I, I don't know, I don't think any of us know exactly where LSSC is headed in their strategic plan but I'm fairly confident that we will have some form of recreation body coming out of any discussions that happen around that. So we would just wanna make sure that uh, the various parks, whether it's Mill River or Groff Park or um, uh, Potwine or, or Kendrick would have somebody that could be slotted into um, this spot. Nate, I don't know if that covers it. Yeah, I mean, right now, you know, LSSC Commission is, um, you know, serves as the Parks and Recreation Commission for the town, you know, even say in terms of the CPA um, process too, in terms of, so it's kind of as their role as a recreation commission, they would be getting the care and custody and control. So if that were to change and there was a different type of commission, you know, overseas parks, then it would, it would just transfer to, you know, to that commission. 
Uh, and I think part A, the one other piece is it you know says in perpetuity for that's chapter 45, section three, and that's that's just a public park. You know, saying that the the property is now officially a public park, and so there's like Dave said, there's some you know um, some requirements there if it were to change use. So it's now you know protected public park space. I had actually thought that was the key wording in this um, right. that that we can't just sell it to a developer without going through a lot of hoops. Yeah, that's the big one. I think the LCC Commission, that's just letting the state know we have some, some group in town that can oversee it. And I think they're less concerned about that. They're more concerned about the, uh, the dedication to that, you know, 45 section three. And we actually have, as you point out, transferred other property into the LSSC Commission for the um, same reason, mm -hmm. for park grant. Practically speaking, the care of the park, mowing the lawn, taking care of the trees, maintaining the, the facility itself would still fall primarily to DPW, which is under the direction of the town manager. So practically speaking, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, DPW would maintain Kendrick Park as they do today. And they would maintain, if we build this playground, they would maintain the playground as well. Anything else before I ask Gabriel to see if she wants to say anything to us? Um, I had, a, I had a, a, a larger contextual question, not specific about this project, so I just want to make sure I can ask it, but it's not on this. It's, so I'd be happy to hear from Gabriel. Well, I can't speak. Um, hi, so Gabrielle Gould, downtown Amherst Bid. Um, I did meet with David. Um, I've also met with Julie at the Hitchcock Center, and I believe that the Bid and the Hitchcock Center would love to be involved in the planning of this park. Uh, for my perspective, having any aspect of the Hitchcock Center being a part of this park would be an incredible economic driver for downtown. Um, they have people from all over the world coming to see their one of 19 on the globe living buildings, and it would be an incredible thing for them to say, oh, by the way, you should hit downtown Amherst and see you know, our, our living garden, our rain garden, very much in line with what you're already doing. It would just be nice to get them involved so that they have a presence here in our downtown area. Um, would you like me to speak to the idea of, of a performing arts shell and the parks and all of that? Yeah, that, that okay. would be helpful. I mean, your vision of the park and how the business community that you represent, um, what they're looking to for Kendrick Park and where this would fit in. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, I'd like to say that I believe that the best thing for this incredible town with three really beautiful green spaces is that they're all very dynamic and different. Um, I see an ability to sort of if you will, program and design these spaces to um, have the full slate of happenings and opportunities, reasons to walk, reasons to continue going in different directions. Um, and when I look at Kendrick and I see this uh, wonderful idea of a playground, because I believe that playgrounds are incredible economic drivers. I know when I had little humans um, getting out of the house, once we were out of the house, I was not going back to the house. I was going out for a cup of coffee. I was going to the bookstore. Um, and I do think that a playground in any downtown area is important for um, community. Um, the bid is going to present in front of the council, I'm hoping in the new year, our proposal to build a performing arts shell. And historically, we are truly looking at the common because mainly, um, if you look at historically, that is where Olmsted, you know, drew his little bandstand or performing arts shell onto it. Um, I feel that there is a component of the North and South common that is the jewel of our town. It's what you see when you come off of Route 9. It's what the Amherst campus really looks at. And I'd love to see that be utilized in a way that brings more life to it. Um, commons originally where, where livestock were auctioned off, where gallows were. Um, and I believe that it would be great to bring more life to our common. The other thing that we are hoping um, to be able to do with our town is to have craft beers, uh, wine, 
tastings, ciders um, available on our common. And I would, of course, if we're doing Shakespeare on the park, wouldn't it be great to have a couple of vineyards on hand to um, be able to do wine while we're watching our Shakespeare um, or if we're watching dance or listening to um, music. And I personally would love to see that as far away from the little humans as possible. Um, I, I've met a couple of our town sort of regulars who like to come to these events. And if we can keep them up at the common where we are, um, I, I would feel better as a human about doing that. And I'd love to see the North Common become that place where there's music, dance, performance, and the ability to have a craft beer, uh, to have a farm to table dinner, to recreate the taste of Amherst. And I think that answers that question. Uh, as far as the uh, liquor on the common question, I think that that's something that obviously is not before us today. We do need some exploration, and it also involves the license commission under Absolutely. the charter. Absolutely. And I have been speaking with them and working with them on that. Dorothy. Um, all of a sudden, I had a very obvious question. I assume that you're going to build a, not a porta potty, but a real bathroom on the Kendrick Park near the playground? There, there are no plans to build you know, a restroom facility or a building there. I think that's a problem when you have a playground with children. I, I think you just have to have a place for them to go. I think within the downtown there are some public restrooms, so they know that really isn't, I mean, that's a much bigger project to put in a, you know, a restroom facility, whether that's, you know, um, you know, a, you know, year-round use or even a seasonal structure. That's something that wasn't part of the project. But it's, it is something to consider if there's more programming happening there, you know, that's, um, uh, yeah. There is another issue that comes up, which I don't really want to delve into today because it will take the Finance Committee aside by miles, and that is if you have public restrooms within the downtown area, then they become available to a variety of people, including some of our homeless population, and uh, there are arguments for and against, but it's not a subject that need, can be decided without substantial consideration. Other questions? Because I do, we do have a big agenda, and I. Okay, my mine was more global. Um, would be, I understand why this is coming to us now, um, rather than the entire package of CPA. So I. Um, and Dave was asked this earlier at CPA, but I'd, I'd like sooner rather than later, and it doesn't have to be today, a sense of the flow of other demands on the CPA money to give it a context. So is the com are the community fields going to come in with a big piece of money and just how the financing works that, you know, this isn't the only recreational area that's high priority, and I know the dredging of Puffer's Pond is on the JCPC, but that's for two years from now. But thinking of the CPA money as an available resource for the town. And, and the way I understand this works is if CPA, well, CPA will be supporting it. If it went out in debt finance, it's not taking 259000 out of the million. That debt servicing, so I just think it a, a, an earlier rather than later meeting, it would be just good to be thinking about the overall context and not, you know, knowing that we have to make this decision now. Um. I, I appreciate that question. It did come up at CPAC the other, the other night last week. Um, and Sonia can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is if, if this went out at about 260 in debt, it would probably be about $30,000 a year for 10 years? For 10 years. So that's really, if you look at the hit to the CPAC budget each year, that's, that's the hit. We have about a million dollars to spend every year. Um, we don't anticipate any large open space projects coming in this year. There may be some smaller requests, but there's no land acquisition uh, projects coming in. The deadline for projects is, uh, I should know it, December 6th? December? 6th. 6th. Is that right? I'm with, Nate knows. Uh, he writes many of the proposals. So December 6th. So, Kathy, I'm not sure there'll be any additional information 
between now and then, uh, I do know that the other high priority for on the recreation side is any consideration of the plan over at Community Field and the high school for field improvements there. So I, I certainly cannot rule that out as uh, if the town and the schools came together with some CPAC proposal for some percentage of that, um, that is possible. Um, but I don't anticipate other large proposals coming through LSSC for, for funding. We have spoken to Barb Bills, and, and I believe she's been in touch with the commission on that as well. So. Okay. Other questions, comments? So I think that where we are at is um, the turning your attention back to the uh, finance order itself, uh, 20, finance order 2045, because if there are any additional questions, what I would, um, we, if, if we are recommending this, then the motion has to be something in the order of that the Finance Committee recommends to the Town Council that it approve proposed Order 2045 um, and takes action prior to December 31 of 2019. So that's what we're angling towards if there is agreement amongst the committee to make that recommendation. I so move. I second it. Okay, so there's a motion that's been made and seconded on the floor. Um, so I guess I'll put, say two, ask two things at once. If anybody has questions about the order itself, to um, please bring them forward. And the other is, before we get around to voting, I always want to uh, make sure that um, if um, either of our resident members who aren't going to be able to vote have things that they want to share or uh, with the committee to please take that opportunity. So I'll pause. Robert? Um, I, you mentioned the, the deadline of December 31st. I don't see that in the order. Maybe we should add that to the order. Um, that's just one comment. But um, I mean, you know, in, in terms of you know, the actual proposal itself, I think it's reasonable. And I think it's something that would benefit the town. It's not typical that we put deadlines of grants in appropriation orders. It is in the contract that we sign. And it's also in the motion. But I'm, I'm wondering, just toward that, in the whereas is, you know, whereas the town needs to make a decision by December, so the whereas is don't go into the contract part. I'm just, you know, I mean, I think that it's the timeliness that why are we taking this out of cycle that I think we're trying to flag. So could it go in the whereas language? It's part of the SCPA report. Oh, so the attached report would be explaining that. Um, Sonia, do you want to um, quickly explain how the um, town attorney and uh, you and the clerk work together on um, these proposed orders that come to us for consideration? I'm sure, but I think Nate Malloy is better okay. handling that since he's dealt with the town attorney and we just all checked it. Nate, you're laughing. <laughs> Pull a rabbit out of the hat. That's so right. The, um, the park grant has a, um, you know, a format that we need to follow. So, you know, most of the resolutions, the whereas, and then the parts A, B, and C are really prescribed by the program. And so, you know, they'd like to see that, you know, there are some resolutions as to why, we, you know, the town needs the funds and the purpose that's being served and then the, the three actions that need to be taken. So, um, you know, town, uh, the town attorneys helped, you know, you know adapt the, the template from the program to meet, you know, the town's needs. So that's kind of where it came from. You know, on that note, Andy, just to your point earlier, my only thought was in Part A, where we mentioned the LSSC Commission, we could have, um, it could be to the town manager, uh, to the LSSC Commission, comma, in their role as Parks Commission, comma, to clarify that, you know, the care, uh, control, and custody is 
you know, to them as, you know, in their role as a parks commission, if we, you know, if, if for instance, if the town, if their role was to change, then, you know, it's really in their role as the parks commission, they're, they're receiving this not just as the LCC commission. Would the state agency um, have any problem if we left it as it is and then should um, something come before the council to transfer the responsibility of the LSSC Commission to a new entity like Recreation Commission, would they just accept that um, as long as, because it would probably say something like uh, transferring um, all right. um, care, custody, and control um, of property that is currently under the jurisdiction. Because as you point out, there are other properties that are there. I think is, is part of uh, Mill River and Graff Park already um, with the LSSA Commission? Yeah, it, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the bylaw review committee. You would actually have to go through and see what is under the care, custody, and control of the LSSA Commission uh, what has been put there, placed there to date, and if there was a new entity doing it like a Parks and Recreation Commission, I, I would think the council would have to go through and say, these, these eight areas or these six parks are now under the care, custody, and control of new entity X. So I think, I think we're safe doing that. I don't think this really needs to change before the vote. Uh, I have a question looking at, um, now, therefore, it be ordered. Okay. So it says control of Kendrick Park. I think it's that one. It's where it says they're going to change it to an active um, plant, a park. Ah, okay. I had it here just a minute ago. Yeah, it's in, it's in Part A. If I'm, okay. Uh, so I was wondering, what is Kendrick Park listed as now? Because it says, from now on, this will be an active recreational park and so I'm thinking, okay, what was it supposed to, what was it before? Because it sounds like you're changing its uh, function. Again, this is prescribed by the state, but Nate, you might be able to say more about that. I mean, the, the park was gifted to us with the express purpose of making it a park for the residents of town. Right, I think now it's under, you know, it's a, it's, it's a park under the care and control of the town manager, you know, but there hasn't been any formal designation for it to become a you know a public park, uh, other than this bequest, and so you know after time there's the, you know s statutory limitations. It would become a park and it would be grandfathered, but that takes a long time. So what this is really saying is it's really the Mass General Law 45 uh, Section 3 saying it's becoming a dedicated public park. I think the you know it says for park and active recreational purposes. That's right. just to meet the the um, grant requirements that you know. They, you know, the park can be anything, and for active recreation, that's just to make sure that it allows, um, you know, like a play area or things where activity can happen. Um, but, you know, in terms of what the state sees Kendrick Park as now, it's just municipally owned property. It's not okay. considered a public park. It's just municipally owned. And the, and the commons, how is that listed? The town common? Yeah. That's actually a town common. So that's, it's not a property. It's still part of the right of way. So the state recognizes historic town commons separate from a public park. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't, uh, recalling the gift from the Kendrick family to the town, which was accepted by the select board 15 years ago, maybe, I don't know. Um, I think it was gifted to, with the understanding that it remain a park, but the arrangement was sufficient to put that into the responsibility of the town manager. Uh, I don't think that this is a significant change, really. Um, I, I think if I could, I, in my discussions with many, many people about the playground, it's more the symbolism that starting, getting active recreation happening in the park. How many of us go by the park many, many times a week or a month and there's no one there. In the summer, you get somebody having a picnic or throwing a, a disc or something, but this would be a way to invite people and give them permission and say, this is a town of Amherst public park for residents, their families, visitors, anyone can use it, you know, dawn to dusk. 
seven days a week. So I think it's a way to activate the park in a way that it hasn't been. Um, so even 15 years ago when we got it as a gift, I can remember most people still thought it was private property and it was rare to see anybody even walking in the park. So I think mm. we've come a little ways. We wanna, we wanna jumpstart that. I have a question. Is this a rentable space for ex like, like the town common? It, it is, sure, sure. Just like you can rent the pavilion at Mill River, the pavilion at um, Groff Park, you can rent. Right now there is a, a process you go through with the town manager to rent or use Kendrick Park, and the town manager approves those requests. And it, the assumption is now that that responsibility would be taken over by LSSE or its or its new designee. Version. Yeah. So that's the real, with the real change of that. Yeah, and again, even the pavilion rentals at the parks like Mill River and, and Groff are delegated really to LSSE the LSSC department, so Barb Bill's staff really does that, but I believe the commission weighs in on what's a reasonable fee, how many times a year do we want to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So I could see something similar here happening. Okay, one more question, and we really have a long agenda, so we need to move on but, and take a vote, okay. but uh, Dorothy. So you've discussed a plan that was made in um, 2011 that was put on hold. And some things that are had there have been done, th some things which have not been done, and the money for the playground. I'm, I guess I'm wondering, there are gonna be some things you're gonna want to do while you're putting the playground in that you kind of referred to, which might not be covered by the playground grant, um, like lawns, sidewalks, tables. And, I mean, there might be some things, or maybe there aren't. So the question I have was, will you be, coming to us again for non-playground related park expenses to as part of the whole job of getting this thing ready? For the most part, I think the answer to that is no. We're, we need to stay between the lines of the design. We cannot, if you authorize the spending for this park, we cannot go over budget. There'll be a contingency. That contingency will, will um, uh, account for any, you know, any changes in the design or, or overages or anything like that, change orders, but we do not plan to improve Kendrick Park dramatically beyond the playground in the next few years. We've got many other priorities at other parks. We're, we're, you know, you all are talking about sidewalks downtown and roadways and, and the, the four capital projects. So we're gonna stay within the boundary of the park agreement, the park grant agreement for this. Again, uh, DPW you know, has their annual budget, their operating budget, and there may be modest things in there for a bench here or, or two, something like that, but we don't see any other substantial implementation of the plan you see behind Nate over, over to my left. Okay, thank you. I just wanna say that we also have some ideas of benches, tables, chess tables, et cetera, et cetera, in all three parks that we will be presenting in the future, and as well as public art. Thank you. Um, so let me um, see if we're ready to vote. Um, I think that we are. Um, the four of us from the committee, um, all of us who are in favor of the motion that's on the floor to make this recommendation to the council, please say aye and raise hand. Aye. aye. So um, I saw four, so it, the vote then is four zero with one member absent. And uh, thank you very much. Dave, Nate, Nate, <laughs> Gabriel, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate your input and uh, the information you've provided. And we will make sure that uh, this gets to the council and can get acted on on a timely basis because we're well aware of the deadline. Um, the president, uh, the council's right here, so she's hearing us. It's going on. Yeah. It's going on the agenda for December 16th. Thanks. Thank you. So um, we have a number of other things on the agenda. Um, last time we had um, started uh, with the uh, fourth quarter year-end FY19 budget update and. 
We had, didn't have a lot of time that day. I said we would reserve a little bit of time today if there were any follow-up questions. It was included back within the packet for this meeting. So um, just want to see if there were any additional questions. Seeing no questions then, I guess, did you have anything, Kathy? Just, just, I'm also taking minutes, but um, repeat the question again. Whether there are any questions about, um, to be asked additional to, um, about the fourth quarter year-end FY19 budget update. So I didn't have a specific question, um, but when I looked at the document that was attached, I saw an annual budget and I didn't see a quarter, so maybe I missed the one that was quarterly. You know, I expected to three, see a three-month budget, so maybe we talk about June the same way twice, so it was a question, I might have not been looking at the right one. Um, that was question number one, and in the future, I'm wondering whether we could have these reports. It talked about how much additional was put into cash. Um, I think it would be useful to get a little chart at the end to show the reserves, the cash in the stabilization fund at year end, um, reserves and enterprise fund, and I've seen that in other documents, but I have to look at too many documents to see that. Mm -hmm. So those were two, and then and I'll just I'll bundle them. Then the third I had is just a general, more general question. If I see that you budgeted um, for $100,000 in legal and spent 80, so there's a remain at the end of the year, does that carry over to the next year or do you, you just start all over again? So when it's the operating budget, it's a new year. Right. So it wouldn't be like capital where you might have appropriated, appropriated something and you haven't spent it yet? Is that? So right, that, operating budgets that close out at year end. If they're not encumbered in a contract, then it would just close out and go to free cash or in designated fund balance to be part of our free cash calculation. Okay. So I think. It, yeah, can I just answer a couple of the questions? Sure. The first one about the quarterly reports. These are cumulative quarter. So you have the first quarter, and then the second quarter has six months in it, third quarter has nine months, and this is the fourth quarter with, all, with the final numbers for the year. And you should be getting one for um, through September. We just haven't done all the transfers yet and everything. So we haven't been able to pull that together yet. So that's just, that's been the town's practice. I'm used to some yeah. corporate report show first quarter this year, first quarter last year, second no, we don't quarter, do second quarter. They don't just do cumulative, but the ten Amherst right. doesn't do that. Okay. Right. And as far as the reserves are at year end, uh, most of the time we don't have our reserve numbers or free cash certified. So that's why it's not part of this report. And it's part of, we, we hope to have it by the time we do the indicator reports, but that's not always the case, so. And so to um, tell you the next step that we usually do, um, because uh, we now have a new elected body that replaces town meeting, but um, in prior finance committees, and this has uh, been a practice that goes back to when I was chair of the finance committee before the other finance committee, we started um, sending this routinely um, after review by the committee to the legislative body. And it, it, we had a memo that accompanied it um, that uh, explains that um, the amount of additional funds does not necessarily and usually does not end up going to um, free cash in its entirety because of a uh, number of things, including, as I recall, unpaid bills. Or not, the, the, the memo had a number of um, reasons why it was not a final number and points out that until a number is certified by um, the Department of Revenue, um, we don't know what the um, effect on free cash will be. Um, it will be a, an addition of a significant amount, mostly because we took out a bunch of money from um, free cash. Did we use free cash for that? For the, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I just wanted to mention that the report does have that memo on there, and it does state the fact that um, this doesn't, 
the increase um, here doesn't constitute free cash figures. Yep. Because this is budgetary. This is only how our budget for fiscal year 19 performed. It's not gap. It's not, you know, free cash. If we had carry forwards and we didn't spend all those carry forwards, that would go back to fund balance too, and that would increase fee ca free cash. Free cash has um, estimated receipts and stuff in it. It's a whole calculation that the state does. So it's, it's totally different than just having extra money at year end and adding it to our balance. So that's why it's not. I yes. also, oops, yes. you had a question about that? I had a question about the oh. oh, I'm sorry. I also wanted to um, answer the reason it's so high this year is because we did get the $2 million back um, from the Health Claims Trust Fund. The other um, factor in here is our uh, permits were up this year. So that um, gave us the extra revenue. And on the expenditure side, again, it was we didn't have to have the surcharge for the full year. So what we appropriated for that, um, for the appropriation town's portion of the surcharge is returned as well. So, and we had quite a few um, open positions that weren't filled. And that's caused the larger money coming back. Hi, I just had a quick question about the, um, on the transportation budget. The uh, public transportation was budgeted at 87, and we spent 33. Was that due to some bus route cuts? No, uh, I think uh, that that's the year that the 53,000 was was um, voted at town meeting, added to the um, transportation budget, and that wasn't spent, so it just ended up getting returned. It was to add routes or something. I'm trying to think back to town meeting, but. What it was about was, and I thought that um, something had been uh, negotiated, it uh, was to make sure that we could maintain a higher level of summer service than was necessary since the uh, university cuts back so substantially on its root structure um, that it was impossible for some people to commute to work using the bus because of the timing of the bus routes, and that was the reason that town so, meeting did that. So is it possible that it shows up in the current fiscal year and it didn't show up in the last one? You know, that it, because it was an allocation to increase the summer hours? You know, because we, this was a whole discussion in the spring on taking that money and spending it. Um, I don't believe it was added to the fiscal year 20 budget, no. You'll check. Yep. So we can take that um, transportation question up again in this, uh, but I don't, unless there's a different feeling from the committee, I see no reason not to include this with the next finance committee report to the council, because uh, that seems to be the most effective way to get this um, to them. So if there's nothing else on the fourth quarter, and I'll pause uh, as I get my agenda back up. Um, the other thing that we need um, to be working on, and I can't, we can't do too much of it today, but I wanted to explain the preliminary budget guideline issue. Um, and I had sent uh, you a document that had both the finance committee and the council guidelines that follow the um, meeting that we recently had on the financial indicators and the trend reports. Um, what traditionally would happen, and uh, Sharon can speak to this too because she was involved with it for the past several years, was that the uh, committee um, had an opportunity to see if we had any questions about the um, proposed budget and as, as it was presented, if there were not, not the whole budget, because obviously it hasn't, but the financial structure that was presented at the end of the financial indicators report and uh, whether there was, um, and if we have questions, we would have that opportunity um, so it's partly that 
question as to whether there are questions and whether we need to ask the town manager to attend our next meeting. The second thing that we do is we confirm in the guidelines the recommendations um, to uh, allocate operating costs, budget amounts for municipal purposes, elementary schools, what we think of is the appropriate amount for regional schools, library, and then uh, capital. And uh, that then uh, guides the budget process because it gives some indication to the schools that the Finance Committee, in this case the Council's Finance Committee, um, believes that they're appropriate amounts and uh, suggests that um, the town manager proceed working with the superintendent and library director to apply those that division that has been recommended. So that's um, part of it. And then the um, other pieces are there is that uh, there's some underlying financial policy issues that were recommended by the town manager in the presentation. For example, uh, not planning to use any um, free cash or uh, stabilization fund to balance the budget at this point in time. And uh, that we um, also are recommending that we not try and seek an operating budget over, um, override from voters to allow us to increase the taxation. Um, and uh, th those are all par become parts of what is in the budget guidelines normally. Um, and if there's a difference of opinion and we need to talk about that, then we need to make sure that we ask the manager if he can attend our next meeting so that he and Ms. Aldrich can um, answer questions. Um, the uh, select board, that, that really describes pretty much of the guidelines that the finance committee process was. The select board was fairly similar except that it has an additional piece to it um, and so we are going to be adopting both and doing a merge document. And um, the other piece is if there is any guidance that um, the council at this point in, in the finance committee to the council wants to recommend for um, operating expenditures um, for any portion of the budget um, that those recommendations uh, be included. Um, generally, they've tended to be fairly um, nonspecific, but talking more about goals that we would, that the select board would like him to achieve. I think when we've heard some counselors talk about the issue of the guidelines and the importance of the guidelines to the council, that's, it's that piece that they're probably most conscious of. Um, so um, I'll, I'll pause to see if there's any questions um, about the, the content, and then I'll talk a little bit about process. Yes, Kathy. Okay, so I, I read last year's and started thinking about what this year's would be, because this will be the first time we've done it as a, we weren't in office last year. Um, so the one of the issues that has come up, and, and I can see the I understand how the budget is put together. Um, it, it came up in the budget hearing with several people from the fire department talking about staffing concerns. Um, and to the extent, uh, as I understand that how we can get to the two and a half percent if it's across the board, is it assumes sort of current staffing and that you're just meeting wage increases. Um, you know, and then you get, as Sonia said, if there's a vacant position, you might get some leeway. But if there were um, staffing increases in fire um, that are, need to be made, and so I had two, this is a two part, that we had a 2017 study on staffing that I think could be updated with the loss of Hadley to have, okay, what is our shortage now given that we're 
20% down. Then are there some policies? I'm just going to go through it, a list because I don't know what's appropriate to come from us, but are there staffing policies? Are there shift works? We um, right now have a student workforce that is taking time for training. It takes up space that could be used for other things. It has a whole fire engine dedicated to us. Uh, a lot of the visits are for lift and assist that the ambulance makes. And I think the Arbor's license as an assisted living should cover it. And if the licensure doesn't, should we be prep prep uh, putting our representatives? They're supposed to train people to prevent falls, but they actually don't have anything in their license that requires them to pick them up when they fall. So, so, and they tell the, so they call us to pick up the person, not when they think something is drastically wrong, but just to literally pick them up, even though they are bathing them and putting them in and out of a wheelchair. And, and that's a high demand on us. Um, so, you know, are there some strategies that relieve the stress on it? And uh, I had a, a resident a couple people I know went and did a tour of the North Station and people were talking, they're on 24 hour shifts now, but they frequently work 38 hours because they need to be held over. You know, so this sense of how people are coping. So my, my more global question is if we think there's an area in the budget that needs particular attention rather than the across the board, this uh, direction to the town manager to come back with a how we might accommodate that, you know, where else in the budget. And it interacts, I know it interacts with the goal of going to 10% for capital, because by going to 10% for capital, we're pulling money that could have been spent on operating. So that was my question. It was all focused on this one set of issues that is now starting to come from, directly from the people who provide for services, but also from residents. Um, so. It was a long-winded, but you know, it's, it's you know, asking for a plan, whether we do a partial down payment in this coming fiscal year and then think if we've got a glide path over four years, you know, whatever it is. So I'll stop. You know, the, in, the one more thing, just on the student staffing, which I think we all really like. Um, the tour of North Station, so I've decided I should do this also. The places the students sleep and their living room is off limit for the people who work there and their quarters don't come close. Um, so just, you know, there's, you know, when you, they weren't even saying anything about it, it was just literally a tour. They said, who's here? And that's this other group, but they can't go out alone on an ambulance and they can't full service. So is there a need to kind of examine all of this as part of how do we uh, deal with what is a perceived and maybe a real problem as we, we go forward and not be silent about it. On, the, on that one issue about the student force, um, I think it was Deputy uh, Fire Chief um, Lindsay Stromgren came and spoke to the select board and made a very um, long-term and impassioned plea for the continuation of that program and justification for the program. Uh, now that we're a new body, it might be important um, as we deal with a bundle of issues to have that presentation again made before a different body. I agree, and if you miss, Students are benefiting from it. Maybe UMass could help us pay for it too. You know, just you know, if you know, just thinking about this as a revenue and cost issue, even if we're totally committed to it, I wasn't saying that we're not. I think that Lindsay was feeling that um, it's justifiable on the basis of the town's side of it and the town's benefit. Um, he was not speaking of it from the university side. Uh, but I don't want to speak for anybody else. I'm just telling you what he said when he presented to the psych board a couple of years ago. Um, but we can take that up and uh, I'll, I'll uh, consult with uh, Lynn at some point about whether 
that's an appropriate discussion for the committee or for the um, and that's why I tried to make it in part of a larger package, too, because if Lipton Assist is a heavy demand, is there some way we can identify things um, that are... My last one was, can we charge the facilities, Applewood and Arbor, um, they don't want to charge the person... If it, if it doesn't result in a ride to a hospital, then it can't be billed to insurance. You know, so you, you get a... A car is out. Um, so... Just, just thinking on what are possible levers that are both relieve the stress or increase the revenues. Can I ask a clarifying question? Is the, is the question that you're getting at how much the finance committee should uh, persuade or encourage the, um, the town manager to uh, increase that budget? Is that? Um, to, I think the question is, can we? Not, not necessarily as, to increase not it, Not necessarily but persuade, but come back with a study that talks about what the plan is to address it, that, you know, that we don't have solutions. Are there solutions? Is, is there a, pro, you know, you know, sort of document the level of the problem? Are we talking about two peop, a two-person problem, a ten-person problem? So I don't have an answer, Sharon, so I was just looking for, is there a, a way because I noticed in the past things that finance wasn't specific getting into these kind of specific issues. But the select board was, and I think that's what the difference, and that's where the difference between the select board guidelines and the finance committee guidelines and the prior form of government were, and now they're coming together into a single document. And uh, the select board probably would have said something along the lines of uh, encouraging the manager to cons um, consider these issues, something like that, not a mandate that he had to increase a budget, but he should, um, that it was, this is an important issue for, um, the board, or in this case, the council would have to make that decision and asking him to consider it. In the end, um, under the uh, new charter, um, it is totally within the manager's discretion as to what he ultimately recommends to the council um, on May 1st, and then we consider and um, vote on, um, but sort of an early opportunity to say, hey, we'd like you to think about these things. And I think that's how it would be put forward in what we do. What I was going to suggest is that I'll take a stab at, before we have our next meeting, writing um, the outlines of a merge document. But these kind, that particular topic that we're talking about, of what to include about recommend, recommendations for the FY21 municipal budget, I was not going to touch because I felt that that really should come out of more dynamic discussion. I can put in something now about what Kathy's asked about, but I'm not going to go beyond that. If I do that, I go that far at all. Um, but I think that that's where we have to go with this um, so that we can get the guidelines. When um, we had that, uh, Financial Indicators Meeting and Budget Forum. Uh, the thought at that point that was expressed was that we might be able to get back to the um, council in December. Um, I think that you're now thinking uh, that that's not going to, that that's too optimistic. Um, but uh, we don't want to get into a situation that um, I've had experience with from the select board, which is it gets pushed back into multiple meetings of the council and then doesn't give the town manager guidance in a timely fashion that he needs to do his work in budget development. So I think we really do need, if we're going to do that kind of recommendation, to not let it delay. Lynn? So I have a couple of questions, and I really need to look to, you know, people like Sharon, yourself, um, Sonia. Um, 
and try to understand the relationship between the goals that the council will agree on with the town manager and the budget guidelines. And let me just say, I'm, I'm chairing the group, Kathy's on it, actually, uh, Dorothy's on it as well. Um, we were trying to come up with a draft of goals for the town manager that the council will then agree to with the town manager, okay? And some of these very same issues have come up in those discussions, mostly, you know, things like, for example, um, taking the framework of the existing fire staffing study and updating it, that kind of thing. Um, so, or looking at the issue of, you know, personnel in terms of library, which is another issue that's come up. So it, it, the goal for, I mean, we would have loved to have been done with this a long time ago, but um, it's a lot more difficult than I think any of us ever hoped it would be. Um, so in fact, we're meeting again today at 4.30 to continue to have a conversation with Paul about these. Our goal, our, our goal, no pun intended, our plan as a committee is to bring them to the council for our first discussion, if you will, on December 16th. At what point do those goals and the budget guidelines kind of merge or inform each other, I guess is the, the um, word I'm looking for. Because as I'm even looking on the draft um, budget guidelines from the select board, you know, they begin to sound a little bit like town manager goals. <laughs> and so, so I, I'm just trying to get a sense of the relationship and is it almost like you need the town manager goals before you can also, before we can finalize the budget guidelines. It's not total overlap, not even remotely, but there is some congruence between the two. Well, so let me take a crack at it. Um, it's like it really is a select board question, not a finance committee question because it was a select board guidelines. I think that we're into just um, the first year of a new form of government and trying to figure it out. Um, the select board was always striving to complete the um, guidelines or, or the goals for the town manager at an earlier date closer to the completion of the evaluation itself because the year that's being evaluated is already half over by the time you get goals done if you wait too long. Um, you were absolutely correct that the goals that uh, were developed for the town manager then um, informed the, the, the drafting of the budget guidelines. Uh, and uh, the, um, of course, our hope was is that the goals would be done prior to the, uh, what is now the financial indicators meeting, it used to be the four boards meeting, and then um, it would all come together and the, and the select board could uh, move fairly quickly um, in completing its work, usually it would see the um, finance committee guidelines about the same time as it was working on its own guidelines. Um, so the whole calendar process is a little bit out of sync. Um, the problem that we have, again, is that if you're going to give real guidance to the manager on either performance goals or on budget uh, considerations that you would like the manager to consider. Uh, the uh, timing is very difficult. Um, the only advantage we have, and it is a big one, is that um, the town manager had to complete his budget by it was January 20th, roughly. Uh, um, under the old form of government, under the new form of government, manager has till May 1st. So uh, there is more time in that piece. 
Yeah. Sonia, I don't know. If I'm kind of lost in the whole process and scheduling too, so. But as far as the budget guidelines are, what the finance committee did in my practice, and when I was part of the finance committee as the liaison, is once the October indicators report came out and the manager had his um, bullet points of two and a half percent for the um, operating budgets and whatever percent we were, we were um, expecting for retirement and all, all of the OPEB and all of that. And um, that would be pretty much the basis for the guidelines that the Finance Committee had, with the caveat that it's really early in the process and these things change and we could go back and ask for more, which we did one year because of the health, health insurance trust fund um, tanking and then we had, um, and there are also times you could come back and say, we're not gonna be able to do 9.5% or 10% for capital this year, we have to close this gap. So when we do 2.5% increases on the, op it's only on the operating budgets. And within each operating budget, the town, the school, we have to cover benefits in there. So there's 2.5% increase, we have to cover all of the salary increases that are contractual. And then we have to make sure we cover all of the health insurance increases. And if there's any money left over, that's what departments um, basically compete for, for additions in their operating budgets or in their um, personnel budgets. And usually the town manager has a, um, an ad list that he puts together what his priorities are to add or restore from there. So it's basically the budget guidelines have always been pretty much what our estimates are for revenue, what our estimates are for spending, and it's a moving target. So to be practical about this, I think we probably at this point should see if people are, first of all, if you're comfortable with my taking a stab at doing a draft of combining the two and um, to assume, make an assumption that um, we um, are going to adopt the recommendations from the presentation that we received of the initial budget page from the trends report, which is traditionally the starting point for discussion. Um, we need to schedule our next meeting, which um, I was hoping will not be December 3rd for the reasons stated before, so I need the people to get calendars out for that. That would be the date we would do this. Um, we will try to see if we can have the town manager at least be here for part of the meeting so that if there are questions that um, you wanted to ask him to do it, but I think we need to see what we can to move this along as quickly. I don't think that we need to make it complicated because the um, goals piece for the spending, um, I think is just gonna be substantially hashed out once again by the council. I don't think that we're going to be the ones who are going to, have the final word on it, nor should have the final word on it. Uh, what we really are more conscious of of wanting to make sure that they have sufficient time to deal with it in over more than one meeting as opposed to uh, trying to feel badly about uh, delaying it. So I think I'd rather move it, um, but um, certainly welcome to other thoughts about it. So that's kind of, an, what I was thinking. So um, I actually had a meeting on December 3rd penciled in for us. I did too, but um, yeah. we have a problem with the two listening sessions that day for the capital right. projects. Right. One of which overlaps in time with when we'd be likely to be meeting. The, the capital projects listening session starts at 3.30. I won't be here on, the, on that date because of the role I have to play in those. And I think that Kathy, you and I have the same problem and Dorothy Wright too. Well, I marked down that I was gonna to go to the seven o'clock one. I mean, I'm not yeah. gonna to go to two of them, but it's gonna be another killer day, I've gotta say, but. 
Well, Lynn has to go. She has to be there, so. And I was at least planning on going because I can't go to the other two, so I wanted to listen to two of them. <laughs> So we're really looking for another meeting time. Correct. And it should, and it needs to be before the 17th? Is that what you're, I mean 16th, is that what you're trying to, to do? Thursday the 5th, same street 230 on Thursday the 5th, is that too? Anybody have a problem with that? I can send out an inquiry. The, the fourth is better for me. And, um, fourth at what time? Fourth, I am wide open. I could do uh, from 3 o'clock on. You have to know your teaching schedule. No, I'm not teaching. I have an office hour. Um, I guess I could do it. We have, we have children for five days, but Bob can hold the fort. Not that it matters, but I'm not here on the fourth. I'm away at a conference. Uh, would, how about the fifth? Would you be here? How, I don't know how long the conference is. It's all day. It's just one day. Yeah. I, so. I'll rearrange something. I could do the fifth. It would be better if I... We didn't meet till three, but I could rearrange something and I'm not meet earlier. Till, till two thirty myself. So. Okay. Shall I send out an inquiry uh, with the rest the of the members of the committee as to whether they're available at two thirty? Okay, so I will do that. Um, Yeah, we want to keep this moving. So 2.30 on 12.5. Let's see if we can do that. And um, I'll get, you'll see something to the entire committee when I send that out. Um, is there anything else that people want to ask or discuss about the guidelines? Because otherwise I'm going to move it along to a couple of other things. Um, can I just? Yes. While we're on. So we're meeting on the 17th at 2.30, though, December 17th. I think so, because we're going to have a lot of things that we're not getting to. Uh, the other thing we need to talk about, um, but we're not going to do, spend much time on it today, is we need to close out the discussion on the housing policy. I don't know when you were expecting that to come back before the council. When it gets there. And um, the other, of course, is Percent for Art, which uh, Kathy can give us a report on, but we do not need to get that into a serious discussion um, fairly soon. And you'll, by the 16th, well, you'll have it earlier, but you will have that doc, revised document. The Finance Committee will. It's done. So will we be doing that on the 7th or the 19th? I thought probably the 19th. I'm sorry. The the, 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 the whatever the fifth or the seventeenth. On the seventeenth, I can come earlier because I have a final exam that gets out at twelve thirty. So, if you think we're going to have a big uh, carpet bag of a meeting, I, I could get here by um, one thirty. I mean, I'm, I'm like, fine. I always feel like I want to finish things up before the holidays. Yeah, I'm coming back on Sunday. I'm fine that week. <laughs> so we're trying to, uh, uh, we've already said we'll poll for the December 5th. But yes. or I think we said the 4th or the 5th, right? Right. Yeah. But now I'm just asking and confirming that we're meeting on the 17th of December. Yeah. Yeah, that had been a previously scheduled date. So just, so you'll poll us, Andy, on the 4th versus the 5th. Because um, Shalini's not here, right? Yes, I'll okay. put both dates on just to see. Okay. I might word it that we were leaning to the fifth, but we want to ask about both dates. Um, 
So we know that we have those. Do you have anything that you wanted to tell us more about the uh, major capital investment listening sessions? I think I'd put that on there as an in case. Uh, Just we've, we, the group uh, that's been advising this, which has done a phenomenal job, has finished up. Uh, we start videotaping uh, the five people who are going to be part of the videotapes. Um, and the PowerPoints, they start taping tomorrow and they finish on Monday and then we hope we're looking at an edited document video sometime probably the day before Thanksgiving. Um, and then um, we start posting all the material on December 2nd in the morning and then we start the listing sessions on December 3rd. A lot of people have put in, in an enormous amount of work on this, Andy included. He did most of the drafting for the frequently asked questions. But you and Kathy did a lot of work because I didn't get involved in the process until we were getting towards the frequently asked questions part. When we ran into trouble. <laughs> um, the. Uh, but you created the questions. It's easier to answer the questions than to create them, actually. Um, in any event, um, I think we've taken care of that. As far as the um, budget process calendar and um, FY20 meeting schedule, I think the, what I just, to let two of you who weren't involved in the uh, meetings last year, um, Bob and Sharon know what happened, and I will try and get this out in a memo and explain a little bit of how the process worked and get feedback for the next meeting that way. Um, we really had to take the uh, old finance committee process of being able to meet with department heads and review budgets in a much shorter time frame because, and I've explained this as I think previously, when you were considering joining the committee so you'd be aware of it, but we literally were meeting twice a week during the month of May. It was a, just a one month thing, but um, it was the only way we could deal with the requirements that um, we would get the budget uh, from the town manager on the 1st of May and have 30 days to turn it around and to make recommendations. Um, so that what's likely is that we will have regular Tuesday meetings um, through up until that point. Whether there's a need for additional meetings this round, because um, we were actually were doing weekly meetings for a while, but I don't think we need to necessarily do that this year because the purpose of it was to uh, give new members of the Finance Committee information about how the budget process and financial rules work. I um, think that this year we can go back into just staying on a biweekly basis up until the point where we're uh, getting the budget, but we then really do need to have those twice weekly meetings. Um, otherwise, we have to decide that it's not important to meet with the um, heads of the various departments and be able to ask them the questions that we asked and uh, uh, that's really what I think is going to be the thing for our, you to think about because um, um, Sharon you've been through the experience and you know the kinds of questions you ask the amount of time and you know think about and I'll ask Mary Lou the same question as to whether you can envision doing it in only four meetings or um, whether you agree that the biweekly schedule for that very brief period is necessary. So I will need your input on that and uh, need Mary Lou's input on that too. Andy, the one question I had on it is that part of it was getting educated, but we'd talk separately about potentially doing a longer, a dedicated meeting on enterprise funds to have enough time to talk about 
not just the next fiscal year, but a little bit longer term and on reserves. Um, so whether that would be telescoped into May or whether we could do that earlier would be my question. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's a question rather than a, this is what I think we should do. Um, so that was just it. And I, I was trying to figure out from this larger list of when the budget is where, whether how often we would be meeting in January, February, March. You know, so are we every other week finance? Should I assume that I'm going to put that in my calendar? You know, the Tuesday yeah. after. You know, so I was just looking forward because it's important for me to block time and I can always free it up. It's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there's one more piece and that is that um, we were also going to ask for more information about how water and sewer rates are set and an understanding of the, um, the development of the recommendation prior to that coming to the um, council and the committee. So sort of an educational piece on that. Uh, we need, that would be another issue to, write, to take up. And um, so it's really two enterprise things. You're thinking of the, I mean, the only thing you can do before you get the budget from the town manager is how enterprise funds are structured and. You no, know, I did understand that, but it's also like what, potentially if we'd had longer time, we would have found out Centennial was due to be completely rebuilt and two more things were coming to us later that we didn't know about yet. You know, just a, a longer discussion of uh, what else is out there. Um, so the, the other question I had on the timeline that we got, it has November 21st, a capital plan form. Is that real? Is that just a... Should I just delete it? I just on, I downloaded the things that came to us, or is that... I, I didn't, it, I didn't, yeah, it's on the, what? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's on, on the printed list, the and, list. and um, I'm assuming that's not real because I haven't really heard about it and it's two days from now. We did a budget forum right after we did the financial indicators, and we did a master plan forum uh, on the end of October. I don't think there's... I think that the... Uh, Today's the 19th. I, no, I, yeah, I, I, no, it's no not happening on the 21st, and I know. the question is, I think what we need to do is to, and I don't want to do it now, take a look at the charter, right. what the requirement is, right. and um, I think we need to also have a discussion about where the uh, JCPC process is and um, make sure that uh, the Joint Capital Planning Committee um, has the benefit of having the forum at a time that is most informative for them. Right. Yeah. I think it is the Regional Capital Forum. Thank you. And that's not a requirement of the charter. That's just what they do. But we do have a requirement for a capital. Um, we do. It, but we won't be doing that until the spring. Unless it's advantageous for the Joint Capital Planning Committee to, and the public to be able to speak before JCPC acts as opposed to after. That's, that's fine. So I think that's really what the, maybe what the question that's is. The, that's, that's the other, you know, we did it, yeah. Okay. Um, I go to yeah, uh, one last thing is, um, just real quick and then we're gonna, I think we can adjourn. We got this letter from the um, regional schools yesterday and um, 
we don't have to take that up to today's meeting. We do have to take it up at our next meeting. Uh, if we are going to recommend to the council that it consider um, objecting to the um, provision um, uh, to that capital expenditure, there's a 60-day limit for action. And uh, so it's, it, it, it's something that we just need to decide whether we're going to make a recommendation or make no recommendation. I think in the past, finance committees have generally not. There's also um, a peculiarity that exists in the entire process, and that is that um, the statute only refers to select boards and town meetings and doesn't <laughs> refer to councils because they've never had a city that's been a part of a, uh, a, a region, yes. I'm just talking to this item. I actually had a conversation with Sean Mangano about this in length, and there's really no action that needs to happen at all on this. This is a borrowing authorization that everybody's already voted on back in fiscal year 18. It's just a housekeeping item to get rid of those words because we have a new DOR staff that don't like these words and they want them out of here. So we ha Sean's just trying to clean it up before he leaves, leaves us. I don't want to cry when I say that. <laughs> But um, basically, if no action happens, then the town clerk just has to um, certify that no action happened. But there's, you can't really not vote this. You couldn't bring it to recommend and not vote it because we're already paying debt service on this. this. These projects are already done. We're already paying for it. So it's really. Thank you. That's helpful to know. <laughs> yep. It would have been more helpful if we had been told that earlier. Yep. But thank you very much. Yep. We can't have a meeting without her, that, we were yeah. going for the December. 4th. Yeah, yeah was, I think that, that is what the too, problem was. That kind of knowledge is too important. Yeah, I think that's why we're, we need to say that because I think that your point is well taken. Thank you, and thank you, Sonia. Okay, um, so can we adjourn? Yeah, we'll adjourn. Yeah. All right, three, three to zero to adjourn, uh, two members absent. And I want to thank everybody for being here. It was a meeting where we covered a lot of territory, but we, I think we actually did some good stuff. So thank you. And I want to, again, thank our uh, non-voting members for your, your participation. I think it's been great. Thank you. And thank you, Amherst Media.